Hi, I'm Dr. James C. Wittig, and I'm an orthopedic oncologist and sarcoma surgeon in the New York metro area. Today we're going to be speaking about small round blue cell tumors, and included in this broad category of tumors are Ewing sarcoma, eosinophilic granuloma, myeloma, and actually lymphoma is included in this group also. Uh, for more information about musculoskeletal tumors, please visit my website at www.tumorsurgery.org. Small round blue cell tumors are tumors that are composed of entirely uh, are composed entirely of cells. There is no matrix. These cells are not producing anything. Um, they're they're mesenchymal uh, tumors. They, they develop from mesoderm, mesoderm and uh, there are benign and malignant varieties. These cells have a hematopoietic appearance. They almost look like cells that would arise uh, from your from your bone marrow or in your bloodstream. And again, there's no matrix production. This is different than your osteosarcoma, which is producing bone, uh, fibrosarcoma, which is producing a fibrous type tissue, and chondrosarcoma, which is producing cartilage. So these are uh, tumors that are composed entirely of cells and no matrix. In your benign variety, um, eosinophilic granuloma is is the entity. Um, it's also referred to as Langerhans cell histiocytosis or histiocytosis X. Osteomyelitis is grouped in this category only because a bone infection can mimic a sm uh, small round blue cell tumor. It can look uh, very similar under a microscope. In your malignant variety, you include uh, Ewing sarcoma, which is the main entity that everybody thinks about in terms of uh, primary sarcomas of uh, bone that are small round blue cell type. Lymphoma, most lymphomas are metastatic. However, there are lymphomas that are primary lymphomas of bone. Metastatic neuroblastoma, multiple myeloma or plasma cytoma, metastatic small cell carcinoma, and rhabdomyosarcoma, which is rare in bone. First entity that we're going to talk about is eosinophilic granuloma or Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Eosinophilic granuloma is a benign proliferation of Langerhans cells, usually accompanied with eosinophils, lymphocytes, and neutrophils, and also scattered plasma cells. Solitary or multiple lesions are confined to bone. Seventy percent of cases consist of a solitary lesion. It seldom leads to disseminated systemic disease. Potentially 10 percent of patients with eosinophilic granuloma can develop, uh, develop widespread disseminated disease or disease in multiple bones. It's viewed as a disorder of immune regulation or a reactive process rather than a neoplasm and all organ systems may be affected with disseminated forms of the disease. Hans-Schuller Christian disease is a form of, of uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis. It occurs between the ages of uh, one and five years and it consists of, it, it is a chronic disseminated histiocytosis. Letter or seaweed disease usually occurs in uh, the less than one, eight, one year of age group, and it is uh, defined as acute or subacute disseminated histiocytosis, and is uniformly fatal. Solitary eosinophilic granuloma is twice as common as multifocal eosinophilic granuloma. It may arise from any bone and any site within a bone, either the epiphysis, the metaphysis, or the diaphysis. And radiographically, it could have a variable appearance. It may appear benign or malignant. It may have a geographic or benign appearance or a permittive or moth-eaten appearance or a malignant appearance. So it could really arise in any location, any location within a bone, and take on any sort of radiological appearance. Hans-Schuller Christian disease consists of a triad, destructive skeletal lesions, exophthalmos, and diabetes insipidus. 10% of patients with unifocal eosinophilic granuloma develop multifocal and extraskeletal disease. 
usually patients are less than five years of age uh, who develop Hans Schuller Christian disease, and patients usually present with hepatosplenomegaly, adenopathy, anemia, fever, and neurological complaints. For the orthopedic uh, surgery residents out there, this is usually the clinical scenario that they give you, and then they they'll give you a bone biopsy, and you uh, come up with a diagnosis of Hans Schuller Christian disease. It's fatal in 15% of cases, and any bone can be involved, but 90% of these patients have skull involvement. Letter of seaweed disease develops in the first year of life, and it consists of disseminated disease and small bone lesions. It's fatal in 95% of patients who develop the disease before the first year of life. The clinical presentation of eosinophilic granuloma usually um, consists of pain and soft tissue swelling. Patients may have a fever, usually low grade, and they may have a mild peripheral eosinophilia in 5 to 10 percent of patients. Um, there seems to be a male predilection for it of a 2 to 1 male to female ratio. <clears throat> and the ages of presentation can be anywhere from one month of age to seven, to oldest patients reported being in their 70s or pro possibly even 80s. It's most common between the age of 5 and 15 years of age, so that's an important fact. Between 5 and 15 years of age, eosinophil granuloma is most common. The most common sites that are involved are the flat bones. 70% of patients present with flat bone disease in either the skull or the pelvis. Uh, the femur may be involved, the humerus, the hands and feet are actually rare sites of involvement in solitary disease. We're going to talk about the radiological uh, characteristics of eosinophil granuloma. Again, they can have a it can have a variable appearance. It can appear permeative or malignant or geographic, uh, which would give it more of a benign appearance. There can be a periosteal reaction around it, which is variable. Here you see a lytic lesion in the bone. It has it is somewhat geographic, but a very indistinct margin at the periphery. There's no surrounding sclerosis, and it uh, has this onion skin periosteal reaction. One may be very concerned about this also being an infection or possibly even a Ewing sarcoma, although Ewing sarcomas tend to be much more permeative than this and have a much bigger soft tissue mass. Uh, patients may have a rind of sclerosis around the tumor. 5 to 10 percent of patients will have a soft tissue mass associated with it, so it can extend into the soft tissues. And some patients may have a sequestrum within it uh, that looks almost like a button. Uh, looking, um, and this is similar to a sequestrum seen in osteomyelitis where a dead piece of bone exists in the center. It gives you a hole in a hole appearance. This is the characteristic radiological presentation of eosinophilic granuloma in the spine. It can produce a vertebra plana, meaning that the vertebral body flattens out like a pancake. It is almost evenly flattened from front to back of the vertebral body, as opposed to a compression fracture where there's usually an angulated portion of the bone. Uh, this is very characteristic of eosinophilic granuloma. If you see this on your board exam, most patients with this are, are braced and observed and the bone will reconstitute itself. Um, in terms of um, sites within a long bone where, where eosinophilic granuloma can develop, it can really develop in any location. It develops in the diaphysis most commonly and then the metadiaphysis in 18% of cases, the metaphysis, and then rarely in the epiphysis. This is a radiographic example of an eosinophilic granuloma of the skull. And you can see here that EG of the skull looks like a punched out defect. There's no mineralization within it. It has somewhat an irregular contour at the periphery, but it looks like a punched out, fairly well circumscribed defect. The skull is one of the most common places for uh, an eosinophilic granuloma to develop. Here's an eosinophilic granuloma of the femur. Again, a regular contour, but somewhat geographic on both the AP and lateral, and a, a periosteal reaction, 
around it. This periosteal reaction appears more benign and solid and uninterrupted. Here's the EG that we had uh, originally looked at, and again, a lytic defect. There's no mineralization within it. It has somewhat of an irregular contour, but appears more geographic than permeative and mothian, and a lamellated or onion skin periosteal reaction. It usually, Ewing sarcoma is much more permeative in nature up and down the medullary canal and usually has a very large soft tissue component associated with it in 95% of cases. Um, this may, uh, an infection may present very much similar to this also. So looking at this, you may be concerned for malignancy as well as EG as well as infection. Eosinophilic granuloma can have a variable appearance on a bone scan. Here's an EG of the right femur, seen over here. This is a very permeative lesion. It has a periosteal reaction around it that has an onion skin appearance. And I would be very concerned about this being a Ewing sarcoma, um, although it doesn't look like there's a very big soft tissue mass. MRI may help you better in evaluating the presence of a soft tissue mass. But it's very permeative in nature, and infection can look similar. Over here on our bone scan, we have a relatively low level of uptake in that EG. MRI is nonspecific in evaluating an eosinophilic granuloma, however it may help differentiate EG from an infection and may be uh, or help differentiate the presence of a tumor versus an infection. And what you see on the T1 weighted image is marrow replacement. Any type of tumor would re will replace the fatty marrow. This is as opposed to an infection. Infection doesn't actually replace the fatty marrow. You see a high signal on T2, which you can see in EG or an infection or many types of tumors. And you may identify a soft tissue mass as 10 to 20 percent of patients will present with a soft tissue mass. This is showing you the MRI of an eosinophilic granuloma, the right femur. You see marrow replacement here in the area of the EG. There's some surrounding edema up here, but you can still see white areas in here that would be consistent with preservation of the marrow fat, which does not occur where tumor is located. And here's the T2-weighted image with a lot of surrounding edema and inflammation and high signal on T2, somewhat heterogeneous here with darker signals mixed throughout it. This is the axial of EG, T1 weighted image, T2 weighted image, and here you see complete uh, replacement of marrow fat and high signal mixed with low signal in this area, and the periosteal reaction around the uh, actual area of the tumor. Here's another x-ray of an EG. This is a distal femur eosinophilic granuloma, and you see a relatively geographic lesion with a thin sclerotic margin around it and perhaps a periosteal reaction in this location. Um, no mineralization within it. And this is an eosinophilic granuloma of the clavicle which has a very permeative appearance to it. So again, eosinophilic granuloma is more common in the flat bones like a clavicle or a scapula or a, the skull and can have a variable appearance from geographic to permeative and mothian and this has a permeative appearance. This would, could be very concerning for being a malignancy and also an infection. This is an eosinophilic granuloma of the distal humerus in this location here. Again a very permeative appearance and somewhat of a uh, uh, a mothy in cortex and the a periosteal reaction around it. This is a T2 weighted MRI image of an eosinophilic granuloma, granuloma of the scapula, very high signal on the T2 weighted image and very well circumscribed benign appearing lesion. Okay, um, I'm going to turn our attention to the pathology of eosinophilic granuloma and it's important to remember that it's not the eosinophils that is that is diagnostic of eosinophilic granuloma it's the Langerhans cell so you have to be able to identify Langerhans uh, cells within the specimen and these Langerhans cells have a very prominent nuclear groove so they have a relatively large nucleus they do have significant cytoplasm that's eosinophilic in color also 
but this prominent nuclear groove gives the nucleus a coffee bean shape and uh, so you're going to be looking for coffee bean shaped nuclei okay you can also see eosinophils but the presence of eosinophils is not diagnostic they do not have to be present in order to diagnose eosinophilic granuloma you can see other inflammatory cells which are also a non-diagnostic component uh, under electron microscopy you can identify Burbeck granules okay very important they often give you this uh, show you this on a on an OITE exam or on a board exam and these Burbeck granules have a tennis racket appearance and ex essentially what this is it's uh, caused by complex invaginations of the cell membrane so these Burbeck granules actually are uh, are produced by these invaginations of the cell membrane and the way the cells are actually uh, cut for electron microscopy. Important to remember that eosinophilic granuloma stays, stains positively for vimentin, CD1, and S100. This is a low power view of an eosinophilic granuloma and what you see is a um, small round blue cell tumor. You see all cells and you do not see any matrix. This this tumor is not producing any matrix. So it's not like an osteosarcoma. It's not producing bone. It's not like a chondrosarcoma which produces cartilage. The cells produce cartilage. It's not like a fibrosarcoma where the the cells or the spindle cells are producing fibrous tissue. And you may be able to make out the coffee bean shaped nuclei in this location or the Langerhans cells over here. These more deeply uh, red staining or eosinophilic staining cells are probably the um, eosinophils within it. This is showing you an uh, intermediate power view of uh, eosinophilic granuloma and you can see here the eosinophils and you can see you can make out all these Langerhans cells they have the coffee bean large coffee bean shaped nuclei okay here's a fairly characteristic one over here there's a few you know they're scattered all throughout here over here so that's that's the cell you want to identify uh, in terms of rendering your diagnosis it's high power view showing you the eosinophils which are reactive in nature and then the Langerhans cells which have these coffee bean shaped nuclei and somewhat eosinophilic cytoplasm. All these Langerhans cells. Another high power view showing you the characteristic Langerhans cells with the eosinophilic granuloma. Very important to take note of their shape, how the, the, you have these clefts within the nuclei which give it almost a coffee bean shape. And when you look at your pathology slides or your examples on your test, you have to look very, very closely at the characteristics of the cells. This is showing you a positive vimentin stain for eosinophilic granuloma. Vimentin is indicative of mesenchymal cell tumors. This is a positive CD1 or CD1A stain. EG is CD1A positive. This is a positive S100 stain. And it may also stain positive for CD10. These, this is showing an electron microscopy of characteristic Burbeck granules. And you see it has a tennis racket shape almost. Here's the handle and here's the, the tennis racket itself. Okay, very characteristic. If they show you an electron micrograph, look for the thing look for things that look like tennis rackets, and you've cinched the diagnosis. Again, this is from complex invaginations of the cell membrane. Other examples of Burbeck granules, again, have this characteristic somewhat tennis racket shape to it.
Okay, the differential diagnosis of eosinophilic granuloma usually consists of osteomyelitis, granulomatous inflammation such as tuberculosis and fungal disease. Hodgkin's disease may look similar, uh, particularly uh, microscopically. So eosinophilic granuloma is a benign disorder. It's not a cancer. Okay, it may undergo partial or complete spontaneous resolution, but that can take some time. And patients with uh, solitary lesions are at risk for developing additional bony lesions within six months to two years after the uh, diagnosis. So you may wish to follow these patients with bone scans. I once had a patient who had a lesion develop in the femur and uh, somewhere over the course of the next two years developed a skull lesion where the child presented with deafness uh, because it was affecting the bone near the um, auditory nerve. Okay. But it is a benign disorder and it can cause destruction, it does cause destruction of the long bones, which could result in a pathological fracture and uh, could result in other problems. Treatment for eosinophilic granuloma um, usually, uh, long bone lesions are only treated if it's, uh, well, number one, if you need to obtain a biopsy, number two, if uh, there's risk for pathological fracture. And you would perform, usually perform a carotage of these in bone grafting. Intralesional injection of a steroid has also been reported. Um, so uh, the answer for your OITE or your exams would be carotage and bone grafting for long bones and weight-bearing bones at risk for fracture. Perhaps intralesional steroids for symptomatic lesions in non-weight-bearing bones, like the clavicle. Uh, complete healing, however, may take an entire year. Low-dose radiation may be valuable for inaccessible lesions. I don't know how much I agree with that statement. Um, it's rare that you ever see uh, radiation given for these tumors. And if a patient presents with vertebral plana, this is very characteristic of eosinophilic granuloma and not any other disease. Uh, they may be braced and observed. Okay, the next entity that we're going to speak about is Ewing sarcoma. Ewing sarcoma is really the characteristic small round blue cell tumor that everybody thinks about. It is a deadly uh, malignancy. It's considered micrometastatic at presentation in 100% of patients. So even though you might not detect metastases, um, there. 100% of patients have micrometastatic disease throughout their body. Chemotherapy is very important in the treatment of Ewing sarcoma. Many, many years ago before the development of chemotherapy, patients underwent amputations for Ewing sarcoma. And if you took 100 patients with Ewing sarcoma, amputated their leg, 100% of the patients died within two years of the surgery. So surgeons stopped doing amputations for it and they saw that it was responsive to radiation and gave radiation for the local disease. However, patients, all patients still develop metastases and died. And now with chemotherapy, however, uh, the majority of patients are being cured. So um, treatment has changed over the course of years where now we're re resecting more Ewing sarcomas as opposed to giving radiation because there are complications that come up with uh, treatment of these tumors with radiation, particularly in the patients who survive. Okay. So some general information about Ewing sarcoma. Um, Ewing sarcoma consists of a uniform, monotonous, meaning that they these cells all look similar to each other, small round blue cells without any matrix production. So that's the characteristic of a small round blue cell tumor. They do not produce cartilage, bone, fibrous tissue, any other matrix. They don't take on the characteristics of a, of a, of a blood cell or of a nerve. Um, and they're monotonous. When you look at these cells, they look like they're almost entirely nucleus with very little cytoplasm uh, around the nucleus. This is the fourth most common malignancy of bone. The most common primary malignancy of bone is multiple myeloma. The second most common is um, osteosarcoma. The third most common is chondrosarcoma. And the fourth most common is, is Ewing sarcoma. 
osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma are the two most common primary sarcomas of bone in children and adolescents. Chondrosarcoma primarily affects adults or patients above the age of 50. Most Ewing sarcoma cases, 85% of them, are associated with a characteristic chromosomal translocation, the T1122 translocation. And this translocation results in a chimeric protein referred to as EWS slash FLY1. Okay, so T1122 translocation and EWS FLY1 chimeric protein. Clinically, patients with Ewing sarcoma usually present with a mass and localized pain. Patients may have an elevated sedimentation rate, a little bit unusual. They may have fever, may have anemia, may have malaise, but again, all these symptoms are a bit unusual, uh, but they can occur and are usually indicative of metastatic disease, the presence of overt metastatic disease at the time of presentation. 10% of patients present with multiple bony lesions. Patients may have an elevated LDH, and probably about 10% of patients will present with a pathological fracture. There's a slight male predominance of 1.5 males to 1 female, and, it's, and this may come from, I mean, nobody really knows, but may come from the longer um, length of growth uh, that males have compared to females. Males grow for a longer period of time than females. It's very uncommon in an African-American patient. So person had a lytic defect in the bone and was African-American, you would, um, you would uh, highly suspect that this is, a, um, that this is a, an osteosarcoma as opposed to Ewing sarcoma, although certainly a biopsy would need to be performed. Patients are usually between the ages of 10 to 25 years of age, and the most common site of presentation is in the diaphysis. This is as opposed to the osteosarcoma, which usually arises in the metaphysis. So 90% of Ewing sarcoma will usually arise from or involve the diaphysis. Um, can also arise from the metadiaphysis, but again, it's involving the diaphysis. Rarely it involves from the metaphysis, and very rarely ever the epiphysis uh, is a source of, uh, of involvement. The most common site of involvement is the femur. The second most common site is the humerus, and followed by the pelvis and the ribs. Okay, so those are your four most common sites. Radiographically, Ewing sarcoma is extremely permeative or mothy and on an x-ray. So looking at this x-ray of a Ewing sarcoma of the humerus, this patient presented with a pathologic fracture, but you really can't see where this lesion begins and ends. That's a characteristic of a permeative lesion. It almost looks like a diffuse osteopenia or osteoporosis of the bone. And you see some, some soft tissue fullness around this. 90% of patients will have an associated soft tissue mass. So if you don't see a soft tissue mass, you have to be suspect that perhaps it's not a Ewing sarcoma. There's a periosteal reaction in about 50% of cases, and usually there's an onion skin and a hair on, or a hair on end periosteal reaction. Onion skinning refer, um, is caused by a colic pattern of irritation of the periosteum. So the tumor grows and stops growing, grows and stops growing, grows and stops growing, and is somewhat cyclical. Hair on end is indicative of a rapid continuous lifting of the periosteum in, in, in the areas in between all the haversion systems. So this tumor grows very rapidly, spreads out through the haversion systems, and in the areas of the bone in between the haversion systems, the periosteum is elevated and creates a hair on end appearance. Reactive bone sclerosis is, is extremely rare, but you may see uh, t that in 10% of cases. There's no cartilage or bone production by this tumor. Again, it's a small round blue cell tumor. Pathologic fracture occurs in 10 to 15 percent, and it's rarely seen as a geographic benign appearing tumor similar to a cyst or eosinophilic granuloma. Perhaps these are tumors that are caught extremely early. There's rare, very rare cases of periosteal Ewing sarcoma with no medullary involvement. Okay, very rare cases, but there are examples of periosteal Ewing sarcoma. Uh, 
Um, this is an x-ray of a Ewing sarcoma of the proximal femur. Again, a permutative lesion. You see here, you can barely make out where the lesion begins and ends. There's some subtle reactive sclerosis around it, and there's an onion skin periosteal reaction, all characteristics of malignancy. There's no bone production in it, there's no mineralization within it, no cartilage production. And the patient is skeletally immature. Again, Ewing sarcoma and osteosarcoma are the most common primary malignancies of bone in the skeletally immature patients. And there is usually a, a soft tissue mass around it. This is showing you an MRI of that ex same tumor where you actually see an extensive soft tissue mass around it that was not easily discernible on the radiograph. Okay, and a very permeative lesion through the bone. There's extensive marrow involvement. Usually the tumor extends much further down the medullary canal on an MRI than you would anticipate based on the x-ray. This is an x-ray and an MRI of a Ewing sarcoma. And on this x-ray, the lesion is barely perceptible. You see some erosion of the cortex. Um, there's permeative bone destruction. And then there's a soft tissue mass, mass, which is much more readily identified on this MRI. So if you look at an x-ray like this and you barely see a lesion, but then the, and you examine the patient, the patient has an enormous mass, you get an MRI. You see this enormous mass around the bone without much changes in the medullary canal. This is highly suspicious for a Ewing sarcoma or a malignancy of bone. Showing you another example of a Ewing sarcoma of the diaphysis of the femur. Very large soft tissue mass, permeative, no mineralization of the soft tissue mass. Again, arising from the diaphysis and then a very large soft tissue mass encasing the bone. Now, with that said, you can, might be saying, oh my God, that mass is so big. How are you ever going to save that leg? When these patients receive chemotherapy before surgery, there's usually a dramatic reduction in size of this mass. The mass may disappear entirely. So chemotherapy is very effective on Ewing sarcoma. Here's a Ewing sarcoma of the right femur, again, permeative lesion, barely perceptible on the x-ray, no mineralization, no periosteal reaction in this case. It's very important to examine your patients and put your hands on them because this patient could have a huge soft tissue mass and you may not pick up the lesion on the actual x-ray. It's a CAT scan of the same lesion which demonstrates a permeative lesion. The cortex is mildly thickened there is actually no soft tissue component in this. There's no mineralization. And just keep in mind that 10% of Ewing sarcomas do not have an associated soft tissue mass. One may think that this is an infectious process, okay? but certainly a biopsy is warranted. And this is the axial CT. Okay, now how do we know that this is tumor and not infection? The tumor is replacing the bone marrow. Okay, you do not see replacement of the bone marrow with an infectious process. And uh, sometimes it takes a highly skilled radiologist to discern this, but again, there's bone marrow replacement here. There's not just edema and infection in the bone marrow. This is an MRI of the same patient, of the Ewing sarcoma, the right femur. The T1-weighted MRI demonstrates it's a permeative lesion involving the upper one half of the femur. You see where the bone is mildly expanded and the cortex slightly thickened. There's no Codman's triangle, no hair on end, no sunburst periosteal reaction. However, the bone marrow, look at the white appearance of it here, is replaced in this location by the tumor. You do not make out any more fatty marrow. T2 weight Im image demonstrates significant uh, edema around the bone and the lesion. It's very high signal on the T2, which is very nonspecific. There is no soft tissue component associated with this tumor. This is an x-ray showing you Ewing sarcoma of the left humerus. Um, it involves the metadiaphysis and extends a significant distance down the medullary canal. It's resulted in weakening of the bone, and the, bone, the patient is presented with a pathological fracture. Um, 
the soft tissue mass is actually up in this location around the more proximal portion of the humerus. There's no mineralization within the within this tumor, and there's a subtle hair on end periosteal reaction, which is difficult to make out. This is showing you the T2 weighted MRI of the, the same Ewing sarcoma of the left humerus, and you can see the permeative lesion down the medullary canal, much more than may be anticipated on the x-ray, and then this soft tissue mass around the proximal component. Uh, bone scans for Ewing sarcoma usually demonstrate intense uptake, as opposed to eosinophilic granuloma, where you can have uh, no uptake, or intermediate uptake, or intense uptake. But Ewing sarcoma usually shows a very intense uptake on a whole body bone scan. Here's an x-ray of a Ewing sarcoma of the scapula. There's a very subtle reactive sclerosis in the scapular neck and in the glenoid in this here. The lesion is barely perceptible. Again, this patient should be examined closely and uh, probably undergo MR examination if they're having pain. This is uh, that same patient with uh, the MRI of the scapular Ewing sarcoma and you can see a very big soft tissue mass. So Ewing sarcoma are usually associated with a large soft tissue component around the tumor. Okay, this may not be readily identified on an x-ray, but certainly examine that patient and see if you palpate a mass or a fullness. Okay, we're gonna speak about the microscopic pathology of a Ewing sarcoma. What you will see is an undifferentiated small round blue cell tumor that's rich in glycogen. So it's going to stain heavily positive for PAS, for PSA stain, which stains for glycogen. Uh, it consists of uniform cells, right? The cells look very similar to each other with scant pale cytoplasm and indistinct cell borders. And the cells are going to be arranged haphazardly. They're all going to be squished on top of each other. The um, they're almost all nucleus and barely any, any uh, cytoplasm. There's no matrix production. These cells do not produce cartilage, bone, fibrous tissue, red blood cells, anything. Uh, they do not produce uh, blood vessels. They do not produce nerve. So there's no matrix production. Again, virtually no cytoplasm. Cells are similar in appearance. They have a characteristic chromosomal translocation, T1122, that results in the EWS fly one chimeric protein. They stain heavily positive for PAS and stain poorly for reticulin. Remember, reticulin is a characteristic of lymphatic tissue or of lymph nodes. One of the entities in a differential diagnosis of a Ewing sarcoma is a lymphoma or a primary lymphoma of bone. Primary lymphomas of bone stain heavily positive for reticulin and are PAS uh, negative or stain very poorly for PAS. Okay. The immunostains that are important for Ewing sarcoma include vimentin. All sarcomas are vimentin positive, CD99 positive, HBA71 positive, and they're leukocyte antigen negative, whereas a lymphoma that stains reticulin positive, right, lymphomas are going to be leukocyte antigen positive. They overexpress mic. Two, which is a proliferation uh, marker detected by CD99 and HB71. So CD9 positive, CD99 positive, and HBA71 positive. This is showing you a low power view of a Ewing sarcoma. Again, it's a small round blue cell tumor. All you see is a, a sea of small round blue cells. They're just all, almost all nuclei crowded on top of each other. There's no matrix, large nuclei with no cytoplasm. You can't really make out the nuclear detail or the amount of cytoplasm around these, but it just looks like a sea of monotonous small round blue cell tumors of similar appearance. Intermediate power view, again, you see a sea of small round blue cell tumors. They look like there's almost all nucleus, very little cytoplasm. They're crowded, they're packed on top of each other. There's hypercellularity. There's gonna be some my abnormal mitotic figures. There's no matrix production here, no cartilage, bone, fibrous tissue. 
right? and the cells look similar size and a similar appearance to each other. This is as opposed to a Ewing I mean, as opposed to a lymphoma, where they're going to have a variable size and appearance because there's usually an inflammatory infiltrate in a lymphoma, and the cells have a variable size and appearance. Multiple myeloma, which is also a small, small round blue cell tumor, the cells may appear similar to each other, but they're plasma cells. So you're going to be looking for clock face nuclei with a perinuclear halo to diagnose a myeloma. Also, myeloma is going to occur in a different age group than Ewing sarcoma. Again, high power view. Uniform small round blue cells, similar size and appearance, monotonous, crowded. There are few mitoses. There are large nuclei with virtually no cytoplasm, no matrix production. There may be some of these pink staining filaments, which is just fibrinous tissue, fibrin in between, okay, from the, from the plasma, the normal body plasma. Again, high power view of Ewing sarcoma. Again, look at these cells. It's almost all nucleus and no cytoplasm. The cells are packed on top of each other. They have a very similar monotonous appearance to each other. Okay, very important, there's no matrix production. This is, CD, this is showing you the CD9 positivity of the tumor. Okay, this is an immunohistochemical stain for CD99, which demonstrates MYC2 overexpression. It's a PAS positive stain, demonstrating the glycogen production by the uh, Ewing sarcoma. This is showing you a reticulin poor stain. There's very few fibers that are present here showing you uh, reticulin. If this was a lymphoma, it would be very heavily stained for reticulin fibers. This is just showing you the electron microscopy of a Ewing sarcoma and to show you how big their nucleus is, how small their cytoplasm is, and they have very few and scant organelles. And the nucleus has this indentation within it in the major majority of examples minimal cytoplasm, and you can see glycogen granules in the cytoplasm. Okay, these granules are probably glycogen. Okay, Ewing sarcoma is one of the most aggressive tumors. Like I had said in the beginning, 100% of these tumors are considered micrometastatic at the time of presentation, whether they're entirely intraosseous or they extend outside of the bone. Surgery alone will not cure these patients. They have a, they're locally destructive. They have a high propensity for local recurrence and a high propensity for distant metastases. And the most common sites of distant metastases are the lungs and other bones, similar to osteosarcoma and other types of sarcomas. And it's noted for its lack of immunological staining. So it's vimentin positive, CD99 positive, um, but um, it doesn't stain for really any other specific markers. And it has a positive chromosomal translocation, T1122. The treatment nowadays for, for Ewing sarcoma consists of multi-agent chemotherapy. Okay, patients are usually given preoperative chemotherapy and postoperative chemotherapy. You, most patients are treated with surgery whenever the tumor is surgically resectable. Um, there are some patients where if, it w where if the surgery would require an amputation, they may be treated with radiation instead of performing an amputation because these tumors do respond to radiation. And radiation would be administered at the same time as surgery would be planned. So you would get preoperative chemo pre-radiation chemotherapy followed by radiation. And um, um, the, the, um, the reason why we don't administer radiation as readily anymore for Ewing sarcoma is because there can be development of secondary sarcomas in the survivors who are administered the radiation therapy. It can also cause other problems such as limb length inequality if the patient's scully immature when the radiation is given, or um, severe fibrosis, uh, severe stiffness, pathological, can result in uh, 
pathological fracture, pathological fracture non-unions, the bone becomes necrotic and can easily fracture. So uh, a lot of reasons not to give radiation particularly since uh, many patients are surviving nowadays. These are the chemotherapy agents that are commonly used for treating Ewing sarcoma. Vincristine, adriamycin. Adriamycin is also used for uh, osteosarcoma, conventional osteosarcoma. Cyclophosphamid, actinomycin D, iphosphamid, and etoposide. Adriamycin is considered the most active chemotherapy agent against sarcoma, so it's utilized in almost all sarcoma regimens. So this would be the the uh, acronym for it would be VACA-IE, V-A-C-A-IE. Adriamycin can be associated with cardiotoxicity. Cyclophosphamid can have some uh, uh, bladder or uh, inflammation of the bladder. Riphosphamid can cause some, uh, also some renal problems. Okay, important for you to remember these. Uh, most patients are treated with surgery. Limb sparing surgery is performed on most patients. Rarely ever is an amputation performed since Ewing sarcomas are also sensitive to radiation. And if surgical resection is not fe feasible, radiation may be utilized for local control instead of an amputation since Ewing sarcoma is highly sensitive to radiation. There may be a cutoff in the size of the Ewing sarcoma, however, where radiation may not be as effective. So some very large pelvic masses that do not respond to chemotherapy um, may be too large to control with radiation. So it may be administered to shrink the tumor and perhaps prevent the need for an amputation, but rarely those patients undergo an amputation. Let's talk a little bit about the prognosis of patients with Ewing sarcoma. Patients who present with localized resectable disease, meaning that you cannot identify any uh, metastases on their scans, even though we know it's micrometastatic, have a five-year survival rate of 54 to 74%, so about a 65% five-year survival rate. Uh, we know that some of these patients will still go on to develop metastases and die, or some of these are alive at five years with active disease or disease that is metastatic. Patients with disseminated disease at diagnosis have a much lower survival. Five-year survival is probably 15 to 30 uh, percent in that range. And disseminated disease at diagnosis means that it's that there are identifiable metastases in, in the lungs or, or other bones. Surgical removal of resectable lung metastases improves survival. Pelvic Ewing sarcoma have a worse prognosis than Ewing sarcoma that develop in other areas of the body. So perhaps patients with pelvic Ewing sarcoma may have a 50 to 55 percent five-year overall survival. And um, in terms of the response to chemotherapy. Similar to osteosarcoma, patients who have a good response to the preoperative chemotherapy regimen indicated by 90% tumor necrosis correlates with a better prognosis. So perhaps we're leaning toward 85% of those patients having five-year survival. Now when I say 90% tumor necrosis, everybody has different cutoffs. Naturally, Ewing sarcomas do not produce matrix, so they shrink markedly with chemotherapy. Osteosarcomas produce produce um, bone and they produce a substance. So they don't necessarily have to shrink to be killed. Their cells can be killed but the matrix remains and the size of the mass may remain the same. So you can have a patient with a Ewing sarcoma where the entire soft tissue mass disappears and you're left with 20% of residual viable specimen in the end and uh, you and an osteosarcoma where it's still a significant mass but almost there's almost no identifiable viable cell so it's a little bit hard to tell exactly what is 90 to 100 percent tumor necrosis but generally speaking if almost all the tumor is gone meaning like a 99 percent uh, tumor necrosis rate then that correlates with a very uh, good response to chemotherapy, although some centers use 90%.
Other important information about Ewing sarcoma is that patients under the age of five should be carefully evaluated to exclude metastatic neuroblastoma, as Ewing sarcoma is very rare in the under five age group. And there is a large cell variant of Ewing sarcoma, which may be confused with large cell lymphoma. Okay, there's another entity which is called primitive neuroectodermal tumor, PNET. And that falls within the Ewing sarcoma family of tumors. It's treated similarly. It looks slightly different histologically. There may be rosette formation on the actual histology, but it falls within the same small round blue cell category. So they're lumped in the same family. Often they're referred to as the Ewing sarcoma slash PNET, P-N-E-T, primitive neuroectodermal tumor family of tumors. Okay, the next entity we're going to speak about is primary lymphoma of bone. Most lymphomas that involve bone are metastatic from a lymph node or from an organ. Primary lymphoma of bone uh, arises directly from the bone without any nodal or organ involvement. It's considered primary lymphoma of bone pr uh, as long as there is no nodal or organ involvement within six months of the diagnosis. Primary lymphoma of bone is defined as lymphoma arising within the medullary cavity of a bone in the absence of lymph node or organ involvement for at least six months after Patients usually present with localized dull or aching pain, a palpable mass or swelling. Most patients uh, have a palpable mass. Usually there's no general symptoms, no fever, no malaise, and the patients appear healthy. Pathologic fractures occur in 25% of cases. Um, this most commonly affects patients after the second decade of life with 50% of patients um, developing, the, uh, with 50% of patients being above the age of 40. It is rare in children. Any bone can be involved, however, the lower extremities are more commonly involved, especially your femur and their pelvis. It's more common in their appendicular and axial skeleton, as opposed to metastatic lymphoma, which more commonly affects your axial skeleton, or more commonly spreads to your pelvis <coughs> and or your spine. Radiographically, most tumors are permeative or mothy. Okay, they have a permeative or mothy uh, appearance. However, some may have a relatively benign appearance. About 10% can look geographic, have a, be a blowout lesion. They may be entirely blastic in nature. Uh, and some patients present with a normal appearing x-ray. The lesion is barely discernible. It's highly permeative. Most, most cases arise, or most uh, tumors arise in the metadiaphysis. And most have a malignant appearing periosteal reaction. However, some may look benign and some may not have a periosteal reaction at all. If a periosteal reaction develops, it's usually interrupted or a solid single layer. But onion skin and sunburst periosteal reactions are also possible, similar to a Ewing sarcoma. Most patients have an associated soft tissue mass. Um, CT is useful for detecting 80% of soft tissue masses, and on MRI, approximately 99% of patients have an associated soft tissue mass. And that's similar to Ewing sarcoma, where about 90% of patients have an associated soft tissue mass. 22% of patients present with a pathologic fracture. Differential diagnosis of primary lymphoma bone includes metastatic lymphoma, Ewing sarcoma, metastatic neuroblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, 
osteomyelitis, and eosinophilic granuloma. Radiologically or radiographically, the tumors are usually permeated or morphine. You can see here a, uh, a lesion in the left proximal femur. It's a permeative lesion. It's may be barely perceptible on an x-ray, and there may be reactive sclerosis. You can see some reactive sclerosis in this lesion. It usually arises in the metaphysis or metadiaphysis of the long bone, and there's no mineralization within it. A soft tissue mass is common, and most commonly affects the femur, the tibia, and the humerus. Here's an example of a primary lymphoma of the humerus, very permeative lesion, barely perceptible periosteal reaction, no, no mineralization. 25% of primary lymphomas of bone involve the flat bones, namely your pelvis, your sacrum, and your ribs. You can have mixed lysis and sclerosis, an aggressive or a non-aggressive periosteal reaction. This is showing you a CAT scan of that same humerus, where you see that the lesion replaces marrow fat. It's a very subtle lesion, but you can see replacement of marrow fat within the center of the, within the medullary canal, which is characteristic of a, of a tumor as opposed to an infection. Primary lymphoma of bone usually shows increased activity on a bone scan. Increased activity on a bone scan in a normal x-ray appearance is highly suggestive of a lymphoma. Again, you're, on the CT and the MRI, you're looking for marrow replacement, cortical destruction, and a soft tissue mass. Sequester may form in 11 to 16 percent of patients, so you can see sequester or a dead piece of bone in, within the lesion, and that also occurs with osteomyelitis and uh, eosinophilic granuloma. This is showing you an MRI and the uh, MRI, MRI appearance of a primary lymphoma of bone usually demonstrates a, a lesion that is replacing marrow fat on the T1 weighted image. It's using intermediate signal intensity similar to muscle. There's an overlying soft tissue component. These tumors grow rapidly similar to Ewing sarcoma and they can penetrate the haversion systems or the vascular channels and extend into the soft tissues without actually destroying the bone. Whereas a benign tumor, to get into the soft tissues you have to actually destroy the cortex to get into the soft tissues. So here you see a permeative lesion and it's permeated through the aversion systems and has created a soft tissue mass. Usually the tumor is high signal on T2 because of lots of inflammation and, uh, and resultant fluid uh, formation in the area from the, from the edema from the tumor. This is a T2 weighted MRI image and you see the lesion in the proximal femur with an associated soft tissue mass. There's high signal within the lesion and there's this soft tissue mass extending into the muscles around the bone. The cortex is intact, very much consistent with a malignancy as opposed to a benign tumor where the, there would be cortical destruction. A Ewing sarcoma can look very similar to this. Again, the primary lymphoma of bone, this is a T1 weighted MRI and T2. See um, replacement of marrow fat with the soft tissue mass and a relatively high signal on the T2 weighted image. Nothing specific about the lymphoma. Okay, this is an x ray of primary lymphoma of bone. You see a permeative lesion with some surrounding sclerosis, a subtle periosteal reaction. Difficult to tell if there's a soft tissue component of this tumor. Skelly immature patient. This is an x-ray of a primary lymphoma of the distal humerus. Again, a permeative morphine lesion, some reactive sclerosis, no mineralization. X-ray of a primary lymphoma of the tibia, both the AP and the lateral, showing your permeative morphine appearance with some reactive sclerosis around it. This is a primary lymphoma of the humerus with a pathologic fracture, permeative lesion, and some reactive sclerosis. Nothing specific about this being a lymphoma of bone, however, uh, certainly looks like a malignancy. Here's a primary lymphoma of the proximal tibia where the patient presented with a pathological fracture, very permeative lesion of the proximal tibia, 
some reactive sclerosis within the lesion, no definitive mineralization, and it's arising in the metaphysis, extending down into the diaphyseal area. Microsco uh, let's, uh, we're going to discuss the pathology or the microscopic pathology of a um, lymphoma or primary lymphoma bone at this point. Usually there's a dis diffuse growth pattern. It consists of a mixture of small lymphocytic cells and larger histiocytic components, the large malignant B cells. The lymph lymphocytic cells are considered reactive in nature and, and sort of an inflammatory infiltrate. There's cells and no matrix. This does not produce bone or cartilage or fibrous tissue, which is characteristic of a small round blue cell tumor. Okay, small round blue cell tumors, lymphoma, myeloma, eosinophilic granuloma, there's no matrix production. The nuclei vary in shape and size as opposed to a Ewing sarcoma where they're all monotonous. And the reason why they vary in shape and size is because of this inflammatory, secondary inflammatory infiltrate. Usually the large malignant B cells demonstrate grooved vesicular nuclei and prominent nucle nucleoli. Cytoplasmic glycogen is absent, so it, seems P it does not stand for PAS, does not stand for glycogen. It has a complex reticulin framework, so it will be reticulin positive. CD5 and leukocyte common antigen are positive, as opposed to your Ewing sarcoma, which are leukocyte antigen negative and CD5 negative. CD20 and CD45 are, po are stains for B-cell lymphoma, and CD3 is a stain, a rare st a stain for a rare T-cell lymphoma. Usually T-cell lymphomas do not form in the United States. Usually they're, they're B-cell lymphomas. This slide is showing you the microscopic pathology of a lymphoma. Okay, it's a small round blue cell tumor. It's all cells and there's no matrix production. This scant, wispy, pink staining stuff is probably fibrin or part of the normal plasma of the body. So there's no matrix, there's crushed artifact. You can see here where some of the cells appear to be crushed and that's typical for where, uh, for, uh, which occurs with the processing of lymphoma for the histological interpretation. And the cells are different sizes and shape because you have the larger B cells and the small lymphocytic cells and the inflammatory infiltrate. So you have a mixed infiltrate here, whereas opposed to myeloma and Ewing sarcoma where it's a monotonous cell population. This is uh, an intermediate power view of a primary lymphoma of bone, and um, or whether it's primary or metastatic, it can have a similar appearance. And there's a mixture of small round blue cells of different sizes and shapes. So remember, there's an inflammatory infiltrate in this, uh, which you can see most readily over here. There's a lot of leukos uh, leukocytes or lymphocytes and PMNs and plasma cells admixed with large malignant B cells, which have these large uh, nuclei and a very distinct nucleolus. So here's some here, over here, over here, and over here. Uh, there's no matrix production. So one of the, the main characteristics of a small round blue cell tumor is that it's all cells and no matrix. Uh, different than a Ewing sarcoma, which is a monotonous cell population, and also myeloma, which is a monotonous cell population. So you see here different uh, shapes and sizes of cells scattered throughout. Uh, very important in the diagnosis of lymphoma. Here's showing you a high power view of your microscopic pathology. You see here the reactive infiltrate, a lot of the reactive infiltrate with plasma cells with the clock face nuclei and lymphocytes, but then here are your large malignant B cells where these arrows are pointing to. They have a prominent nucleolus, very large nucleus and scant cytoplasm. Again, the cells are different sizes and shape, different than, different than a Ewing sarcoma. Another high power view of a lymphoma. Look at the cells being different sizes and shape and different types of cells. Maybe some PMNs, some lymphocytes, but then the very large malignant appearing B cells, such as this one with the big nucleolus in these cells, the large malignant appearing B cells. 
differential diagnosis histologically is Ewing sarcoma, chronic osteomyelitis, and leukemia. The treatment for lymphoma bone, primary lymphoma bone is usually chemotherapy and radiation. Um, some patients, particularly scully mature patients, may often be treated only with chemotherapy, which seems to be effective at eradicating it, even if it's intraosseous disease. There may be some justification for surgical resection for primary lymphoma of bone because of, um, because of its primary nature, and uh, although chemotherapy and radiation seem to be very effective, uh, particularly in the adult population. Patients at risk for pathological fracture um, or patients who have developed pathological fracture requ will require some form of stabilization such as an intramedullary rod or a plate and screws. Next entity that we're going to talk about is myeloma, which is a plasma cell a proliferation. Okay. It's a proliferation of your plasma cells which are the normal antibodies uh, forming cells of the blood or of the bone marrow. And um, myeloma uh, is, you know, looks just like a small round blue cell tumor or looks similar to Ewing sarcoma. It's a monotonous population of cells, it occurs in a different age group than Ewing sarcoma, it usually occurs in more of an adult population after the age of 30. And, the, uh, and more commonly above the age of 50. However, it's characterized by plasma cells which have clock face nuclei and a perinuclear halo. Okay. Myeloma is a malignant proliferation of plasma cells. There are two types, multiple myeloma and solitary myeloma, also called plasma cytoma. Multiple myeloma involves multiple bones. It's an intraosseous plasma cell neoplasm, produces multiple lesions, and can be uh, identified in the bone marrow. Solitary myeloma, meaning that you do a bone marrow aspirate of the iliac crest and you see a, a higher percentage of plasma cells um, than normal. Solitary myeloma or plasma cytoma is also a neoplasm of plasma cells. It produces a single osseous lesion. It's not detectable in the bone marrow. You do a bone marrow aspirate and the, the percentage of plasma cells is not elevated. It's also known as solitary plasma cytoma of bone. And most patients with an isol isolated plasma cytoma eventually develop multiple myeloma. So these patients are observed over the course of time, and the majority of them ultimately develop multiple myeloma or develop multiple uh, lesions and lesions in multiple bones, as well as um, an increased percentage of plasma cells in the bone marrow. Uh, multiple myeloma is a systemic disease. There could be many different symptoms, and it can affect many different sy symptoms many different systems in the body. The patient can have bone pain. They can have anemia from uh, suppression of their bone marrow. They can present with a pathologic fracture. They can have neurologic complaints from spinal cord compression and neuropathy with tumors that have involved the spine. They can present with a fever. They can have hypercalcemia, which can be dangerous. They can present with renal failure and proteinuria. 10% of patients develop amyloidosis. Patients may have coagulopathy. They may be hypercoagulable or hypocoagulable and have a bleeding diathesis. They also have immune dysfunction. They, they, they're immunocompromised from this disease. This is the, considered the most common primary neoplasm of bone. Okay, it's not a sarcoma, but it's the most common primary neoplasm. There's a slight male predominance. All ages can be affected but it's most common over the age of 50. Multiple myeloma may occur in all bones of the body, may affect all the bones, but the most common sites of presentation, or the most common sites involved, are the areas where red bone marrow exists, namely your pelvis, your spine, and your proximal femurs. Solitary myeloma is most common in the thoracic vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae, ribs, scapula, pelvic bones, skull, mandible, and lung bones. It may also occur virtually any place, but again, these tend to arise from areas where there is red marrow, where it, and these are the location of where 
this is where plasma cells usually reside in the body. Uh, there may be laboratory abnormalities with myeloma. You may see a monoclonal spike okay, on your serum protein electrophoresis. You may have Bentz-Jones proteins in your urine, so Bentz-Jones proteinuria. You may have anemia and elevated ESR. Sometimes the sed rate can be higher than 100, and hypercalcemia may be present. The uh, monoclonal spike most commonly occurs with IgG. 55% of patients. A is the second most common. IgA is the second most common spike, and rarely IgM, D, or E. 20% of patients have Bentz Jones protein in the urine alone without elevated serum immunoglobulins. So your SPEP may be negative, so it's important to also check the urine on these patients and do 24 hour uh, urine testing. 10% of patients have a, uh, uh, may develop amyloidosis. Okay, this is very important for the OITE and the boards. Patients may present with POEM syndrome, P-O-E-M-S, uh, which this may be often associated with osteosclerotic myeloma. So about 10% of patients can have osteosclerotic myeloma, meaning lesions that are not purely punched out defects, but associated with some sclerosis in the bone or uh, sclerotic lesions. And these patients may have coexisting POEM syndrome, which consists of polyneuropathy. So they'll give you a, 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 um, an example for the, for the OITE where the patient presents with neuropathic complaints, endocrine problems, and these sclerotic lesions in bone, and then show you a histological example of myeloma. So patients have polyneuropathy, organomegaly, endocrinopathy, monoclonal gammopathy, IgA is actually more common than IgG with, in this syndrome, and skin changes are very common. So that's where you get your POEMS, P-O-E-M-S. Uh, bone scan can be negative for myeloma. Okay, not all lesions result in bone turnover. The osteolytic nature of the lesion may overwhelm the osteoblastic response. But 80% of lesions for patients with multiple myel for patients with multiple myeloma will be positive. So bone scan can still be useful. It's important though to get a skeletal survey to detect those lesions that may not be positive on the bone scan and to evaluate patients for uh, impending or potential pathological fracture. Um, again, osteosclerotic myeloma may be evident. It, have, it, have, it involves less than 3% of patients and is often associated with POEM syndrome, sclerotic lesions and increased density of the bones you may see. Here's some radiological examples of myeloma. This is diffuse skull involvement, just diffuse punched out defects in the skull in a skelly mature adult. Here's an example of a myeloma of the femur, just a punched out lytic defect, no mineralization, sometimes can look fairly well circumscribed. There was another larger lesion in the left femur where the patient presented with a pathological fracture. Can anybody above the age of 50 with a lytic lesion of the bone, the lesion is a MET, myeloma, or lymphoma before it's any sort of sarcoma, because MET's myeloma and lymphoma are far more common than sarcoma. Here's diffuse involvement of the elbow region with myeloma. Again, you can see where the bone is extremely thin, and this patient would be at high risk for a pathological fracture. Here's a, an example, an x-ray example of myeloma involving the distal femur. And you can see it almost gives you a mothy in appearance here. But these defects are very typical of myeloma. They look like a punched out hole in the bone. No mineralization within it, minimal surrounding sclerosis. Here's a, spine involvement is very common with myeloma could just present as a lytic defect with a compression fracture, or may def present as a diffuse osteoporosis with a compression fracture. Again, involvement of the scapula in this location, large lytic area in the scapula. 
This is an example of osteosclerotic myeloma. You can see all these sclerotic lesions in the bone. Certainly, if this was a woman, you could not discern this from a uh, metastatic um, breast cancer. Uh, lymphoma can rarely have a similar appearance, particularly in the vertebral body. Uh, patient also had a compression fracture. Um, again, biopsy of one of these would show a plasma cell dyscrasia or plasma cell infiltrate. Osteosclerotic myeloma of the spine. Again, sclerotic lesions. Okay, if this is a male or a female, might not be able to differentiate this between prostate cancer and breast cancer unless you perform a biopsy. Again, osteosclerotic myeloma of the proximal humerus presenting as sclerotic lesions and possibly uh, coexisting with POM syndrome. Polyneuropathy, organomegaly, endocrinopathy, monoclonal gammopathy with IgA may be more common, and skin changes. This is an example of a plasma cytoma of the clavicle, which it's destroyed the clavicle and certainly resulted in a very large soft tissue component. Again, there can be very large soft tissue components with myeloma, okay, or with plasma cytoma. This is showing you the microscopic pathology of myeloma. Okay, it, it's uniform small round blue cells, so a sea of small round blue cells that also looks monotonous like a, like a, um, Ewing sarcoma. However, look at the individual cells. It's difficult to see on this low power view, but you see a lot more cytoplasm around these cells. Okay, and you see a very eccentric nucleus, particularly over here, maybe a perinuclear halo and some chromatin staining in the, in the nucleus, um, indic, uh, indicative of a clock face nucleus. So you, you don't see matrix production. You have plasma cells with eccentric clock face nuclei and a perinuclear halo and sheets of cohesive cells, similar size and shape. So these cells are all crowded and packed on top of each other and look very similar to each other. This is showing you a high power view. Again, very important to take a close look. On the low power, you could probably identify it as a small round blue cell tumor. Certainly here, you can identify it as a small round blue cell tumor. There's no matrix, no bone, no uh, cartilage, no fibrous tissue. You see these eccentric nuclei and somewhat of a clock face nuclear, but then the perinuclear halo around the nucleus, okay? And these you, should, you will have to recognize as being plasma cells. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about the treatment and prognosis of uh, myeloma, which is extremely, extremely complex nowadays. And there's a complex algorithm that I'm not entirely familiar with. I do know a lot of patients are undergoing bone marrow transplants. Generally speaking, if it is solitary disease, plasma cytoma, patients are treated with radiation. They may require some form of stabilization and then usually observed over the course of time. If it's actually multiple myeloma, many patients, if they're capable, are undergoing stem cell transplants. But the prognosis depends on the stage of the disease and the percentage of plasma cells in the bone marrow. Less than 5% plasma cells in bone marrow is associated with a better prognosis. Okay. In terms of multiple myeloma, we perform surgery usually for fixation of pathological fractures or impending pathological fractures. Chemotherapy may be indicated and it induces remissions in about 50 to 70 percent of patients. Uh, stem cell transplants may be indicated. Radiotherapy is indicated for bone pain or impending pathological fracture. It may be effective for individual lesions. The majority of patients who come to my practice are uh, already have pre-existing pain and significant destruction of bone. Um, they may have been treated with radiation already, but the bone has not filled in and usually warrants some form of fixation. Um, in addition, uh, many patients with the team that I work with, Dr. David Siegel and his uh, entire team, Dr. V. Saul um, and Dr. Richter, um, 
in many instances when we're treating a patient for an impending or an actual pathologic fracture, I remove or I scrape the lesion out of the bone and we uh, do not perform radiotherapy afterward and we've had very good results with this with very minimal recurrences. Uh, most deaths from myeloma stem from infections or renal failure. The renal failure occurs due to the increased antibody production or the Bentz-Jones uh, protein that's produced in the serum. Okay. In terms of solitary myeloma or plasmacytoma, up to 50% of patients with solitary myelomas become multiple myelomas within a few years after diagnosis. You may consider surgery for a solitary myeloma depending on size, location, fracture, or appending fracture. Radiotherapy is the most common treatment, however. It usually allows for resolution of the lesion, and often only radiation treatment is performed, and then the patient is observed for development of multiple myeloma. And if multiple myeloma develops, then the patient is considered for stem cell transplant and or chemotherapy. I'd like to thank you. Uh, this concludes our, our lecture on small round blue cell tumors. For further information on musculoskeletal tumors, including uh, other lectures and videos on uh, videos of surgical procedures, please visit my website at www.tumorsurgery.org.